Hi, everyone, and welcome to our program today. My name is Paul Bemis. I'm the president of Applied Math Modeling. And we're going to be doing a session today on uh, non-raised floor data center designs and optimizing them. And I've got quite a bit of material to cover here in 45 minutes. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, a couple of things to note here. This is a go to webinar session. Um, so your mics are all muted, which generally works better for these kinds of events. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, there is a question box over there on the right on your go to webinar session, and you can keystroke in a question. That usually works pretty well. I have that up on another display sitting here, and I can watch those questions, and I will try to answer them as we go. And I may try to unmute a microphone here or there to see how it works. That generally causes issues, <laughs> but uh, we can try it. Um, a recording of this is being made. So for those of you who registered but weren't able to attend, uh, you can get a recording. It will come about a day later. And for those of you who did attend and might want to watch it later, again, um, uh, you'll also you'll also get a link. Okay. So uh, let me just tell you who I am. For those of you who don't know, um, I've been in the computer business a long time. I was a design engineer for Hewlett Packard on high performance computing, worked in the high performance computing space for a long time, went into the software business, worked for ANSYS uh, for quite some time, both in finite element analysis and also fluid mechanics. 2008, I started my own company uh, to go after a target audience. I could see needed uh, a special solution. Uh, we have done it for data centers. This is a uh, cool sim and it is specific to modeling of data center applications. We also deliver it on a SaaS model. Uh, in fact, we've just moved to the AWS cloud, so it's a cloud-based service now. It is client server, so there is a, a client builder that you'll see me use today. You submit your jobs to the cluster for computing. This gives you virtually unlimited computer capacity uh, together with an application on a pay-as-you-go kind of basis, pay-for-what-you-use kind of basis. Very, very cost-effective. We are all experts in CFD and fluid mechanics and final analysis and engineering, so we are a staff that will support you throughout the entire uh, process of building and uh, delivering these results to your customer or to your colleagues. So that's what Applied Math Modeling is. Um, Today, we're going to be talking about predicting thermal performance in a non-raised contained data center. Now, we see a lot of these here. So uh, what I'm going to be showing you is what I'm seeing. I'm kind of sharing with you some of the designs I see and the pros and cons of them so that you can be better informed about these designs in your own environment or better informed when speaking to people about these designs. Now, these are contained. The primary goal of containment, of course, is separate hot and cold uh, with a pressure differential. Um, this makes the air handlers work better because the air handlers, like uh, any kind of heat exchanger, uh, likes a big delta T. So the difference in temperature is what drives those things. And uh, that's what, uh, what makes them most efficient. And uh, also, it drives the energy costs down because you could do things like use more free cooling or economizer, uh, or just the, the, again, the delta T on the, the heat pump makes it more efficient. So what you want to do is try to separate the two. Now, many people will argue, well, you know, as long as I supply more air to the room than the, than the servers need, I should be all set, right? Well, the answer is not quite. Uh, because what goes on in a data center is a localized pressure variation that can cause issues. Some of those we'll, we'll, we'll view today. It does require some attention as well to cooling failure analysis. One of the downsides to containment is that if you have a cooling unit failure, your data center is at more risk than it would be if you did not have containment. And that's simply a result of compartmentalizing uh, the hot or the cold and not allowing it to mix in the room uh, where you would have more overall volume or overall capacity. It is, that is something we refer to as transient studies. I'll review that probably in the next webinar. I'm doing a lot of transients lately, so we'll talk about those next, but, but this one will be steady state uh, just on uh, 
just on the containment of the hot oil itself. Okay, so first, let me do a few definitions here. I'm going to be using some terminology throughout this webinar that I want to introduce to you first. Uh, this is RTI. This, these metrics were first proposed by a friend of mine named Magnus Herlin. Magnus, uh, many of you may know. He has a lot to do with the teaching of, of airflow management in the DCEP training, the Data Center Act Engineer Practitioner training. If you haven't taken that uh, course, you probably should because it helps. And one of the metrics he came up with that I think makes a lot of sense is uh, return temperature index. And this is, uh, you can do it as delta Ts. I tend to do it as flow rates because I'm a fluid uh, person. But it is the ratio of what the racks demand up here in the numerator. So this is, this is what the racks want compared to what's being delivered by the air handlers. It's just a ratio of those two things uh, times 100. So, so this is going to be a fractional number. Uh, you always want the air handler to be bigger. So this should be uh, 100 or less. I mean, optimally, it's 100 where they're completely balanced. But in order to get them perfectly balanced, all of this air has to go to all of these racks. Now, the way we determine rack flow rate is simply the uh, equation of uh, convective heat transfer, which says that uh, you need a certain flow rate, mass flow rate for every kilowatt of power. Uh, turns out at, uh, at altitude, at no altitude, at zero altitude, it ends up being about 100 to 150 uh, CFM per kW. And I'm going to use English units here today. I apologize to my international friends. Um, English units is what I grew up with, or what I call American units, because we use kilowatts for cooling, so it's not quite English. But I am going to use CFM instead of uh, uh, cubic, cubic meters per second, or cubic meters per minute. And I'll use Fahrenheit today as well. Sorry about that. The other one is rack cooling index. Uh, there's two of these. There's RCI high and low. RCI low is not really an issue, uh, so you could kind of ignore that one. RCI high is, you can think of this as the number of hot spots. Uh, how far out of compliance are you with um, the recommended, and I use recommended here, uh, recommended temperatures of rack inlets. So this is another uh, parameter that uh, that uh, Magnus uh, uh, worked on and, and proposed and is now part of that training. We include these metrics in our output report now for Coulson. So we calculate these for you. And the point is you, you want these to all be 100. A, a perfect design has them all at 100. Um, that's optimal. You don't want any hot spots, so that needs to be 100. You don't want more air than you need because that tends to cause inefficiency, both in terms of energy and thermal conditions. And of course, you don't want it too cold. You want your supplier temperatures to be high enough so that you don't fall below the ASHRAE recommended standard inlet temp. Okay, so those are some definitions I'll use today. I'm also going to reintroduce you to our old friend, Mr. Bernoulli. Most of you know this guy. Um, I think he was actually Swiss, um, but nonetheless, he came up with these equations I have here. I just grabbed this out of Wikipedia, so that's an image that's a little fuzzy. But uh, This one is dynamic pressure over here, and this one's static pressure. This one in the middle has to do with height, of course. It's density times uh, geographical pull. Uh, I mean, ge um, pull of Earth's gravity, gravitational pull times height. You can ignore this in a data center. The height doesn't change, so it really turns into a relationship between velocity and static pressure. Dynamic pressure includes momentum. Remember that it's movement. It has velocity in it. And it's also squared compared to just plain static pressure. So as the velocity of air in the data center doubles, the static pressure will decline by four. So there's a relationship always in a data center between velocity and pressure. And what you really want is static pressure in a data center. You want to push it through the tiles or push it through the rack or you really want static. But in order to get air into the room, we have to pump it in. So velocity is, is something we deal with. But the relationship of these two, the balance between these two, static pressure and dynamic pressure are something I'm going to be talking a lot about. Remember that total pressure is the sum 
uh, of static pressure plus dynamic pressure. And the dynamic pressure is related to the static pressure uh, by the square root of velocity. Just something to keep in mind today as we go forward. So now I'm going to show you three levels of containment in increasing detail. And I'm going to show you this um, uh, through modeling. And also, I've got some animations here, and I'm going to be using um, some multimedia here. And it doesn't always work. So, <laughs> so, so viewer beware that this may or may not work. It usually does. But if it doesn't, I'll come back and do it again. OK, so the first one is uh, assume the racks don't leak at all, but the containment leaks. Something's got to leak. Right, but we have leakage in the data center. There's no question about it. And uh, many people will build these things and assume no leakage, and that's fundamentally incorrect. Uh, so you have to assume leakage somewhere. So uh, you can assume the racks don't, but the containment does. You can assume uh, the racks don't, but containment leaks where the rack intersects the containment. That's uh, often what happens. And then you can assume the racks leaking as well, and it leaks around the racked rails. I'll show you those in a moment, and the containment intersections. So this is the anatomy of a rack. This is a little CoolSim model that I built and made a picture of. And I've got it uh, transparent at the moment. And you see inside there is a, a series of servers with different load densities. So you know these are all different colors because the black is, by the way, nothing. It's blanked, so that's nothing. But the blue, the gray, and the green are different levels of uh, heat load. And then the rack is made up of, of course, a front door on the rack and a back door on the rack. Those are generally a uh, high percentage area open. So they're quite permeable. There's not much resistance to those elements. There's not supposed to be any unless it's a special kind of rack or it's got a chimney on it or something. This a back door is supposed to be highly permeable. I usually set that to be. 85 or 90 percent permeable same with the with the door front door if i build them like this um, but the rack rail this guy right here uh goes around the perimeter of that rack if you open the door of a rack which i encourage you to do if you haven't been near one lately there's a rail at the bottom there's a rail on both sides there's a rail at the top and inevitably these leak um, because the, the equipment may not have been put in perfect. There may not be a blanking panel. It may be an old rack with holes up here. Uh, and that turns out to be a problem. So rack rail leakage is where a lot of uh, uh, bad things happen. Performance in a data center is often related to rack rail performance. If we look at it from the front, we see that it's about six inches on the top about three inches, six inches sometimes on the bottom, three inches on the side. It can be an issue for hot aisle or cold aisle. Remember, you're trying to seal one side of that server from the other and build a pressure gradient across that server from hot to cold or cold to hot. And so you need a seal there. It's the same thing as a vapor barrier on a building. You have to have a seal to keep the pressure uh, on one side, pushing uh, the cool air through the server. And uh, you can build these as assemblies. We support assemblies in CoolSim, so you can build these and save them off and use them. Um, they do get expensive in terms of data. There's quite a bit of data there, but you can do that. And including the rack rail of assembly is really a best practice. Now, how do you do it? Well, one way to do it is I call this level one, level one leakage modeling. You just allow the leak it, the the containment here, and this is a data center with air handlers on both sides blowing to the middle. And you use the CoolSim construct of uh, rack rows. So CoolSim has a rack row concept where you can put a count in. You can put a rack of a certain size and then put a count and it will just lay them in there all next to each other, assuming there's no leakage. And uh, you can put a containment above it, around it, and let that containment leak at a certain percentage. Uh, not bad. This is a quick way to do it. Um, in really large data centers, this is the way to do it because the models get big if you're not careful. Uh, here we're letting this one leak at 5%, so there's a little bit of leakage in the containment. Usually on these surfaces, not on these surfaces. I, I don't generally let these leak because they generally don't leak. I usually let these leak. And that's uh, really quick to lay those out 
and uh, fast. Uh, but it doesn't focus leakage on the area where it really occurs, which is, which is down low here. So level two is same as level one. By the way, uh, in CoolSim, you can have a baffle slice right through the rack. So, so many of you are trying to make the baffle the size of this section right here from the top of the rack up. Don't need to do that. You can slice right through the rack, let the rack pop through the baffle a little bit, and it will run fine. A rack to us in CoolSim is really just a block with an inlet and an outlet on it, inlet on one side, outlet on the other, and a function in between it that calculates the heat transfer and the flow rate. So with that in mind, you can also just put another baffle here. One of the great things about CoolSim is it has a, a hierarchy. If you put a baffle in after, an earlier one, and you set them to be coplanar, the most recent baffle added to the model has priority in its uh, parameters. So here I've simply put in a second baffle, and I've set it to a higher leakage, 10%, and I've shut this one off. So that's not hard to do. I mean, you're just really putting a second one in. It's coplanar. So you line them up exactly in the same exact spot in that axis. And you notice there's a gap over here on the left, and there's a gap at the top. And I move this up off the floor a few inches. So now we're modeling the leakage around the perimeter of that rack. And that's more accurate, more appropriate, uh, more detailed. Um, generally, you can get more detail in all these models if you just keep going and adding fidelity to them. It's not always necessary, but that's a very uh, easy and, and not computationally expensive uh, approach. So you focus the uh, leakage on the area right there. And the model size does go up. Solve time gets a little longer. Complexity may go up. You need to line things up correctly. Uh, CFD wants things to be lined up perfectly. Otherwise, the mesher will try to create a bunch of cells in the gaps or misalignments that you've created. Now, one more level up from that is here. Here, what I've done is made individual racks and let a gap occur between them as well. So instead of using our normal structure where we define one rack and then put in a count, here I've made these racks a specific size. And the size, in terms of width, uh, is um, just about 18 inches. So, I'm um, sorry, 19 inches. So the width of the rack generally uh, of the server itself is about 19 inches. And that dates back uh, to many, many years ago. Uh, when I started building these things, they made the servers 90 inches wide and they, they pretty much have stayed there. Now, some will be wider, so you have to be careful of this. But inevitably on either side, there'll be a gap, often uh, three inches on either side. And so you see here, I've got six inches. So this is the same as the earlier design, but all I've done is made the rack less wide um, to account for just the server itself instead of the whole rack, and then replicated it. And I've got gaps on the top, on the bottom, and the sides. Now, what I'm really modeling here is rack rail leakage. Uh, that's really what I'm modeling. That's where it leaks, by the way. And also, because I've got six inches above it, I'm modeling the leakage of the interface. So I've really covered the interface to the containment, and I've also covered the rack leakage between racks uh, in this representation right here. It's most representative of a real world situation. It can be more expensive in terms of compute time and model size because there's some pretty small surfaces here. I'm talking about six inches of gap in a model and these things can get to be hundreds of thousands of square feet of size so um, you know the models can get bigger but we've got enough computational capacity to just hammer this thing run times on these kind of models is still running about an hour or two <laughs> on my you know, big big cool sim models so so the run times aren't that bad uh, we're using parallel processing of course and concurrent processing so we're throwing cheap computing at these models, and you're able to build them out pretty big now and still get reasonable run times. So that's what we call level three. Yes, yeah, so I do have a question coming in. Uh, will you send us a copy of this presentation? Absolutely. Anybody want to reach out for a copy of this, I'll send it to you as a PDF. But 
Remember, it's not going to include all the animations and so forth because I can't put those in PDF. Uh, it will include the hyperlinks, however. So I'm going to show you a, a clip here. Uh, this is going to take a few minutes, but I wanted to show you this just to show you how quick it is and how easy it is to lay these things out. Um, this is a little bit of a, a you know, cool sim demo, I suppose, here, but it nonetheless uh, just gives you an idea how quick you can do it. So here I'm going to set this, uh, the number of racks here to 10. And uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do this level, level two first. I'm going to get this um, up off the floor by 0.5 inches. So I brought it up off the floor. I'm changing the rack load to 10 kilowatts. I'm assuming average watts per rack here. And I'm going to line this one up so that I try to use, you know, as close to whole numbers or at least one dot after the, you know, don't go to two decimal points if you can help it kind of thing, regardless of what unit number you're, what unit you're running in. It's just easier if, if things are lined up. So I'm lining this one up. Now on the Z, I want it to um, uh, have a small gap on that leading edge. So I'm going to set this one to, uh, to 14 uh, and then just a little, three inches, 0.25. So I'm gonna move that off a little bit. Um, and there's my there's my rack row. Now I'm assuming no leakage between racks in this particular one. Okay. Um, now I can also clone that. I can clone it. Uh, clone is a construct where we're able to take a structure and just replicate it. Um, and so I'm just cloned it over. So I have a four foot cold aisle or hot in this case, hot aisle. And then I'm going to reverse the flow direction. Boom. I've just laid out 20 racks. Now, to do my containment, um, I'm going to use baffles. But here I'm showing you that there's a gap underneath it. There's a six inch gap under those racks. And now here I'm going to start to lay in that first level containment. So I bring in a baffle. Baffle is an object that we use in CoolSim, and it allows you to um, install leakage. And you notice it says in room right there. And I'm going to rename it. You'll find out why I name things later. They're easier to find. So I'm going to name this containment. The fact that it's in the room means that uh, it goes from the floor to the ceiling without me having to worry about calculating that. And I'm going to set the, uh, the airflow here to 10% leakage. Okay. And uh, in terms of lining it up, I'm just going to first just drag it over here to get it close. And then I'm going to uh, set the parameters of this to be start at 17. So that means I've got a three inch gap over there. And I'm going to set the length of it uh, to go all the way down and get to the other end. Um, question came in about uh, parallel processing. Yes, we use parallel processing on CoolSim automatically. Uh, we just take advantage of multiple cores automatically. It's built into it. Um, so yeah, we go to 21 here uh, uh, feet. I'm going to come back a little bit on that so I have the right gap down at that end. Uh, you'll get to know these numbers as you build these models because you can remember what the number was, 20.5 on that. So now I have uh, that uh, on one side. Now I just want to clone it. I know I'm going to go uh, seven feet because um, there's four for the a uh, hot aisle, and then I've got uh, one on each side. So I go, sorry, six feet. Okay. So now I have the second one. Now I just do a control C, control V to copy and paste so that I keep the same structure. And now I change the, uh, the orientation of it. So it's in a, it's in a different plane. It's in the X, Y plane. Uh, the planes on, this is, this is ANSYS at the end of the day are fluent. So my X, Y are on the page and my, I'm sorry, my X, Z are on the page and my Y comes out. So Y is straight up in uh, this coordinate system. Now I bring this baffle down here. I wanted to show you as well alignment. So I click on two, hold my cursor over the one I want, hold still, right mouse click to align. So cursor over the one you want to hold still, close gaps in Z. The right mouse, there it is. Now I can simply clone this again. You notice the use of clone. It's such a handy tool and it's fast. It just does things really fast for you. So CoolSim was designed to be really easy to use uh, and quick to build. 
I've had people tell me this is the fastest uh, tool for laying out data centers. So there's there's my um, hot aisle containment right there. And uh, I've got leakage. I'm going to turn leakage off on these ends because I don't let them leak. They don't tend to leak on the ends. They tend to leak down the rails and also in the intersection between the servers and the and the containment, but they don't generally leak on the ends. So there you have a little containment right there, a little pod. We generally refer to that as a pod. Um, and that's uh, how you lay them out quickly. And that's kind of level one modeling, level one leakage there. We're just letting the surface right around those racks, the containment leak. Now the problem with percent area open is if the surface area gets too big, you get a lot of leakage. So depending on the height of that room, the amount of leakage will vary. But uh, here are the only thing I'm missing to sort of make this thing go is uh, the uh, grills. The ceiling grills uh, need to be put in as well. Um, so now here what I'm going to do is start to put the leakage in. I'm going to go for level two leakage here. So now I'm going to move this to general. I don't want it to go from floor to ceiling. I'm going to superimpose this right on top of the other one. So here I'm going to make that Z direct Z dimension exactly the same because this is going to be coplanar at the end of it. I'm going to merge this with the other one. And I'm going to name this something different, rack rail leakage. Again, I'll show you later why, but naming it allows you to find it later in case you want to change its parameter. Here I'm going to set this to 10% leakage. And uh, that is going to be my rack rail leakage. Now here I want to shut leakage off on this one now because I don't need it anymore. I'm not going to be leaking on that surface. I'm going to be leaking on a smaller surface closer to the servers. So here I pick this one up, uh, right mouse or double click either one to open the editor. Every object has an editor. And I'm going to uh, change its dimension and height to be just above the servers. My servers are seven feet. I want six inches above it, six inches below it. So I'm at eight feet. I'm going to change the color so I can see it once it becomes coplanar. That's a, that's a trick to learn. I learned the hard way, as you will, if you make two, two baffles coplanar and you merge them, you can't see them anymore because they're the same color. So yeah, I just do that so I can see it. And now I'm going to merge this by simply uh, picking on this one and I'm going to duplicate it first. Another trick, duplicate it so you don't have to go pick it later. Select these two, right mouse, hold your cursor over the one you want to hold still. So you notice over here on the right, I'm holding my cursor over the one while I right mouse and close gaps, boom. This one, same thing, I select them both with my control key. I align to Z min to get them lined up in that axis. And then I click on them, put my cursor back on the one I want to hold still, close gaps in X and it sucks it in. And now I've just implemented a much better uh, method for modeling racks, for modeling leakage around racks. I've got six inches above it, six inches below it, and three inches on either side. That's a fairly good representation of rack leakage right there. Rack, um, in this case, perimeter leakage. Now, the reason I told you about naming is because when you open the pre-simulation report, you can edit these parameters, and now I know where they are, uh, so I can see them and I can change them. If I want to increase rack rail leakage, I just go there and change it. Now, like I said, the only thing I'm missing here is some ceiling grills to let that hot air out and into the ceiling plenum. So I just put ceiling grills in place here, and I tend to line things up when I put them in. This is, um, uh, you know, I've learned the hard way that uh, you want to line things up as best you can. I usually set the percent area open for about 80 or more because these are quite open. Uh, usually in hot aisles, they're open pretty, pretty wide. And I'm gonna line it up, I'm gonna use size. I remember the length from before. So I'm gonna put it in at 20.5, boom, there I have it. Now that's what we call a, a pod. That's a little pod right there of uh, racks and uh, rack rails, uh, well, at least perimeter, uh, and also um, ceiling. Now I can group this. Another great thing about CoolSim is it has this grouping feature rubber band it, group it, now it's a single entity, and I can clone it. So now I can lay out the rest of them. Generally, the data centers have a lot of symmetry. I'm gonna do three copies of this with an offset of 20 feet for each of them. 
and I hit the apply button and I've just laid out four of these pods. Now I can rubber band that group and uh, group it and clone it and uh, lay out the rest of them in the other axes really fast really fast for laying out data centers my friends this is probably the quickest way you'll ever see as far as i know and i've been hanging around this business a long time fastest way you'll be able to lay these things out is to do it um, using these tools in, a, in this product I, I don't know anybody else that does any faster and i know everybody in this business at this point so it takes a moment because it has to collect all of that data and put it into a buffer and then it replicates it boom so I've just laid out here, um, what have I got? 12 pods, I've got 240 racks, um, uh, 2.4 megawatts of load in a 10,000 square foot space in the course of just a few minutes. So that's pretty quick. Now, if you want to go one more level, delete those other ones, I'm starting over again with one. Now, one more level of complexity would be that um, I separate these racks uh, by a gap between them. So let me get rid of this one over here on the far side first, and I'll go back to this side and work on it, and then clone it. So first, let me uh, get rid of this guy, just uh, select it, hit the delete key, gone. Go back over here to this guy and uh, select that one. We're going to take the count down to one, so we'll take it to one, that's no longer a rack row, it's gonna be a rack. And we're going to change the width to be not two feet because that's the whole rack. What I want is the server. I want it to be 19 inches or the equivalent in millimeters. And then what I do is simply clone that in the Z direction. So that happens to be the axis I'm going in. I want them still offset by the same amount. I want nine of them, boom, done. That's quick. And then, of course, I take that set and I um, put it into top view. Don't you just flip that switch. And then uh, you take this group right here, rubber band it, group it, make sure you've only got the racks, group it. And now I'm gonna clone it with offset again um, to get it to the other side. So I need three and a half, uh, this is the width of the rack, plus the four foot uh, between them. So I just uh, offset it by 7.5, hit the apply button, boom. Now, you notice it's uh, the air is going in the wrong direction, but we have a right mouse click. We just added it, edit, I gotta rotate, Look, boom, boom. Otherwise I'd have to open the editor for each one of those racks. It's just quicker to rotate it. You can open the editor and flip the switch, but it's just keystrokes here, my friend. So now I can group that and do what I did before, simply clone it, clone the whole structure. By the way, you can export the whole structure and save it off in a file for use on a different program or if you use a shared drive among users, you have two or three users at your account or your company, you can share on a shared drive different objects with them. Uh, Coolsome allows you to export everything. So here I just laid out three and I'm doing the same thing. Now I'm gonna rubber band this and I'm gonna clone it. So group it first, then take the group and clone it in the Z direction. And uh, it lays it all out for you. Very fast uh, assembly here. So I wanted to show you this simply because it's easy. It's easy to lay these things out correctly. What cloning does for you is it lines everything up perfectly. So the measure doesn't have to create a bunch of saw, uh, cells associated with offsets and proper offsets or gaps. If you do the first one right, you can clone it. Now, not every pod is the same, not every rack row is the same, I get it. But there's a lot of symmetry in the data center. And even if you control C, control V, uh, instead of cloning, you can at least duplicate it. And in the pre-simulation report, you now have all the parameters you need. If you wanna change your parameter, you select it, edit, you can change rack rail leakage for example, for the entire structure uh, there. I picked two of them, but you could pick them all. Same thing with racks. We now have hyperlinking here in the pre-simulation reports. If you wanna change loads, you can. If you wanna edit a rack, you can. 
So Coulson's gotten a lot more friendly with respect to parameter variation. This will grow over time. We don't yet have a search on parameter change replace feature yet, uh, but this we're getting at most of the key parameters here that you typically use and giving you a way to manipulate them. So I, I wanted to show you that simply because it's it's something that I use a lot, it's quick to do. And now what we're going to do is we're going to look at a few different designs. And to do that, I'm going to first bring them over. I've got them in CoolSim right now, and I've got CoolSim up, and this is one of the designs that I'm going to show you. This is a very classical design. I see this a lot. I call this a one-sided design. It's got air flowing from one side. Uh, the way these work is air comes back, in this case, up around the top. And over here may be a bunch of stuff. You know, you may have a bunch of air handlers over here and a bunch of complicated machinery over here. And I've seen some of you try to create the geometry exactly as it is in the CAD drawing. It's not really needed, my friends. All we care about is the size of the opening coming into, in this case, a supply plenum. These aren't always there. Sometimes these are just fan walls without, without this. But the size, the mass airflow, which determines the velocity and the temperature, that's what I'm interested in because the velocity is the key. That's again back to pressure and momentum. As it turns out, you know, these are never big enough because they're going to throw air at a pretty high velocity and that's going to cause pressure variation. Often these designs will have some kind of mechanism here to unify the pressure so that if one of these is down or two of these is down, you get an even distribution through these grills. Not always, sometimes this is a screen, sometimes it's diffusers as here. You see the racks over here are uh, model, as I mentioned uh, earlier, I'm doing the high detail on these. Uh, these devices are, uh, are sensors because I'm using a VFD on this. So the sensors are, again, really easy to do with a clone. So you do three of them where you want them and then replicate them n times, and then group them and replicate them throughout the whole data center. So the clone button really gives you the opportunity. And you can see here, I left them up high over here because temperature is, I'm gonna use temperature to modulate, and temperature is usually higher at the top than it is at the bottom. But that's how you lay them out. That's a not an unusual design right there. Okay, so that's one design. The other design, that I wanna uh, show you today is a dual-sided. So here's a dual-sided design, same basic idea. This is how you model it. Uh, this construct right <clears throat> here that I'm using is actually a derivation of the in-row cooler. So if you drag in a crack unit into CoolSim in its non-raised floor, it'll come in as an in-row. So this is mimicking the, the APC in-row units that were used, uh, now used of course uh, as part of Schneider, that's a popular unit. But you can change the shape and the size and make them essentially an air handler, or at least the inlet of an air handler. And this can be an evaporative unit over here, or it can be a compressed unit, it can be a free air, it can be anything you want. All you really care about is what's coming into the supply plenum, its size, and its mass flow rate. So the key parameters on this device right here, if we click on it, are going to be right here. Mass flow rate, supply temp. Even the cooling capacity is not that big a deal. You notice I have it in here, but uh, cooling capacity is usually not an issue in data centers. You can do the math on that on your hand. You know, you can say, well, you know, it's a two megawatt data center. I'm going to need two megawatts of cooling or more, right? You're going to need a little more. So cooling capacity is usually not the issue, particularly in these designs, because cooling capacity is usually underrated because they're not, uh, they're assuming a 70, well, an 80 degree return air temp. And in hot hour designs, you're driving a lot more than 80 Fahrenheit return air temp, hopefully. Hopefully you're driving it at 90 or 100. So these devices are usually underrated anyway. So I don't find cooling capacity to be a primary concern. My focus is mass flow rate and supply air temp. You wanna to try to drive that number as high as you can and drive that number as low as you can for optimal uh, energy. But you see here another a classical design and these will all have a little bit different uh, performance outcome on them, okay? And we're going to review that. So I've run these models. I've got, uh, and we're at 940 here. I'm trying to be sensitive to time because we're all busy. 
So I've got one, two, three, four, five of these designs here. And we're going to start looking at results. And I'm going to teach you a little bit here how to interpret results quickly. And I'm going to use some of the uh, parameters that I defined earlier. So let's first go for this one. Now, one of the nice things about CoolSim is that you can uh, look at results using a hyperlink. Uh, so this is the output report of, of that model. And it's broken up into two sections. So over here are all the numerical uh, values. So underneath each one of these carrots is a set of numerical values. Over here is a hyperlink to all the 3D uh, images. And we're going to be getting into those quite a bit. But one of the great things about CoolSim now, just released in version 5, is that you can get your results not only integrated into the client, you know, on the return, because th that's always been there, where if you have a, a, a design and you've run it, the output report shows right here in the report. Same thing, right? This is CoolSim, and this is the input side, and in the lower left-hand corner, you have a tab, and this is the output side. But in addition, you can get it as a hyperlink. So you notice I'm pointing at the Amazon Cloud right here. And I can even copy that, and I can put that into the paste buffer of, um, of the chat that we're in. So if I control V that and put that in the paste buffer, those of you who are watching, go to your uh, uh, chat window or go to webinar. You'll see a link there. And if you click on that link, you're going to be staring at the same thing I'm staring at. And uh, so what I've just given you is the ability to view full 3D design, full CFD output, without the need for any localized software to be installed on your machines. And the beauty of that is you don't have to go get the admin guys to come install some sort of viewer on your machine. Now, some of you have admin rights, and that may not be an issue, but many people don't. So hyperlinking is a really, really nice way to do this. So anyway, uh, let's get into the, the uh, design here. The first thing I want to show you is this data center energy report, which lists RTI and RCI. Now, look at RTI, 104, okay? Now, remember I told you earlier that this is a ratio of what the racks demand versus what the air, air handlers are supplying. And you want that to be 100 uh, or less in the case of RTI. Uh, same thing with uh, RCI high, that's 100. That means I have no hotspots. So from these two parameters right here, I always look at these to see what's going on. And I encourage you to do it too. 104 means I'm not supplying quite enough air to satisfy the needs of these servers. Now, if we look up here under data center description, you'll see the real numbers. I'm supplying 214. My racks want 224. So already I'm going to have somewhat of a pressure and balance going on there. And you may ask why. Well, the answer to the why is that I used a VFD. And if we get down and look at the VFD report, um, I did a set point of 70 degrees Fahrenheit on those sensors that I showed you earlier. 77. Oh, I set it high. I set it for 77, a uh, max temp. And you see it modulated all those air handlers. There's a bunch of them. They max at 50, and it modulated them at 35. So um, it's satisfying my set point. But, you know, with control systems, it doesn't mean <laughs> it's actually satisfying all of your criteria because I'm getting some hotspots here in this design. To see them, I go over here to 3D files. And these are all the hyperlinks. The one I always look at first is ASHRAE recommended range. So this is the ASHRAE recommended range of inlet temp. And this correlates very closely to the, the uh, RTI, RCI numbers, in particular RCI. We often call these Visine charts. Um, for those of you old enough to remember the Visine ad where it was get the red out, you put the Visine drops in your eye and the red goes away. What you want to do in data centers is get the red out of this picture. Uh, this is the ASHRAE recommended range for uh, temperature inlet. And you can see we're in pretty good shape here. We're conforming to, to that spec. However, we are getting a little warm. If we look at the full range of temperature here, you see this data center is not symmetrical. You see that I've got uh, issues over here where it's getting a little bit warm in that section. And that's why um, the, uh, the numbers are the way they are. And we're running it at 104, which means there has to be some leakage going on here. We, otherwise it wouldn't run. The, 
the pressure of variation is not uh, positive everywhere. And you can see it leaking through the bottom a little bit, some gradient right down there where it's starting to suck through those rails. Uh, another one that's important to look at is the slice of Y. So Y is the vertical axis, and I'm going to show you a couple of thermal maps. Thermal is a better one to look at, and I've got one at Y equals 6. So we're going to go up to 6 feet, which is um, a couple meters of, of height, and I'm going to blow this thing up, and I'm going to use keystrokes here. So Coulson supports keystrokes. So I'm going to support, I'm going to go with a Y key. And then I'm going to hit my control key and use my arrow key to rotate this thing so that it's oriented the way that we're used to looking at it. And I'm going to use an M key to turn off perspective. And there, my friends, is rack rail leakage right there, exposed in all its ugly glory. See temperature coming in here. You can see this one blowing by. This is, this is hot air coming through the rack rails due to a localized pressure variation that's encouraging it to do that. It comes from two places. Now, one is that in the hot aisle itself, you have two streams of air coming at each other at a fairly high velocity. These are 10 kW racks, so, and I've got them spread over the whole height. So if it was smaller, it'd be even higher velocity. But I've got high velocity air coming at each other into the center. So remember, as the velocity declines, the static pressure rises. So in the center of this aisle, I have high pressure that causes it to push back through. The other thing going on is uh, you can see in some places, like over here, uh, this one's exasperated by high velocity coming from these diffusers down this aisle. And of course, it's high velocity, so what happens is it creates a low pressure in this region and encourages that air to come out through those rails. I see this a lot. And if that velocity is high enough, it'll cause the server to start to scream in terms of its fan, fan speeds will rise. So that is a real good uh, picture. And you see the leakage up here is caused by high velocity. Now we can see that as well in the velocity cut. We take a look at velocity at the same exact height and we use the Y key and the N key and we rotate it around. Uh, so you can see it, you see that high velocity right there. And that's what's causing it is the air comes in from these diffusers and hits the edge of that rack and comes around it, velocity goes up. As velocity goes up, the static pressure drops as a square of the difference in velocity, according to our old friend, Mr. Bernoulli. That's the problem. So having your racks too close to a distribution wall can cause this phenomena to occur, and it will cause your rack rails to leak if they're not sealed properly. Now, depending who you are, if you're an enterprise customer, you might have control over the sealing around the rack and in the rack. If you're a co-location uh, provider, you may not, but you may have rules about what people need to do to seal those racks up. And if you don't, I encourage you to put them in place because this will happen. Just because you have more air entering the room than you need doesn't mean it won't leak. The other one I wanted to show you here is return path lines. I wanted to show you on the back side of those racks, the return path lines. So here we are. By the way, these, this output is automatically generated for you by CoolSim. You're, I didn't do anything here. This is, this is the way it comes. <laughs> it's, it's fully automated. So um, I went Z and I went N to get it to, to orient in that fashion, to turn off perspective. And we're looking straight at these hot aisles. We can also turn off surfaces. So I'm going to right mouse here and I'm going to, or is it left? It's right. So I'm going to hide this body. I'm going to do it again. Hide body. That, these are... This is ANSYS software, this isn't mine, I'm just using theirs. We, we build on top of ANSYS so I get to take advantage of all their great stuff, and so don't you for a much less money than you would have to normally. So here is the, the issue I was telling you about. So here is high velocity uh, coming out, and as it goes to zero, because they bang into each other right in the middle of that hot aisle, you get a surge in pressure, static pressure goes up and it wants to push back through those rails. You can see it pushing back through already over here a little bit down below because this stack is in the way and it can't get anywhere, you can't get out, so it's going out there. Um, so this is a case where we don't have enough air because our VFDs aren't set properly to keep the RTI ratio at 100 or less. You really want it less than 100, you want to oversupply 
because you need an M plus one case anyway, usually. If one of these go down, you still need to supply enough. In this case, we certainly have enough supply. There are 50,000 each. There's no question we have enough. The, the issue is that the VFD at 77F ended up setting the air handlers to only supply uh, a fraction of that, 38,000 each. Uh, so, okay, so there's that one. Let's go have a look at uh, the next one. Um, this is a dual a dual sided with a with a fan wall. Okay, so this is the one I was showing you earlier, by the way, there's always a shaded image here. Uh, so that's that's this uh, design that I was showing you earlier, very common design, you've got fan walls on each side, uh, you're pushing it through a screen, this is designed to unify the uh, the pressure on the backside in case, because these are non symmetrical, look at the their groupings of four. That's really not perfect. You want you would like that to be really uniform. And so the way you try to uniform it, and by the way, you can't because of geometry and columns and physical world problems. So what you try to do is put in a screen like this one, set it at some percent area open, that's less than 100. So it unifies the pressure on the backside. So regardless of which of these units are on or off, you get a uniform distribution of pressure, and therefore you get a uniform flow into the room, at least in theory. <laughs> So again, let's go right for, and by the way, I can share this one with you too. So I'm gonna copy this URL. I'm going to paste it into the, the uh, chat box. Those URLs are good. They'll be good for uh, a long time if you want to uh, make bookmarks out of those so you can view them, feel free. Furthermore, you can view that on any device with a browser, including your phone. I know this because I'm doing quite a bit of this. Um, so, so here we are, and um, here's my data center energy report, RTI 94. Nice. That means I'm oversupplying. I need to oversupply, remember, in order to uh, have an N plus one case, or the hope of an N plus one case. So um, at 94, my RCI uh, 100, so I have no hot spots, and I'm supplying air at enough, uh, enough, uh, uh, temperature so that I don't have problems here. If you get down into the 60s, this thing will drop. But for the most part, it's these two you need to worry about. This one's in fairly good shape. And uh, let's go have a look at the actual flows here. So this is, uh, we've got a million coming through the air handlers. The racks only need 968. So in general, this one's going to be a uh, pretty good shape. Let's go have a look. Well, first one is my, my uh, my visine chart looks good. I knew it would because the RCI high is at 100, so that's good. Let's take a look at the full range of temperature. That's the next one I look at. This gives me more indication of what's going on in the room in terms of granularity. Just because I'm oversupplying doesn't mean I don't have issues. You can see some issues cropping up over here. So this is running still below the recommended 80.4, but we're getting into the 80s over here. That's some leakage say, well, that's kind of interesting. Why is it leaking over here? This data center also struggles, I've noticed, over in this area. These aren't doing all that well. And this always turns into just plain old geometry. So what do I mean by that? Well, these are the air handlers over here, and their air is coming in, and it's not being evenly distributed throughout the room. Hence the need for CFD. I was told early on that we would no longer need CFD now that we have containment. And um, <laughs> not quite true, <laughs> because you learn a lot about a distribution of air and how to optimize it. So here is air coming from the air handlers. Um, let's again take a look at this in a Y. Um, let's turn off perspective and let's clean up the room a little by hiding some surfaces. So let's hide twice. That's a pretty good shot. So take a look at what's going on there. Very high velocity on the leading edge of some of these devices, like right there. Now again, velocity is your not your friend. <laughs> it's, it's your enemy because it trades off uh, with static pressure by um, a second order function. Again, you double the velocity, you drop the static pressure by a factor of four. So uh, you see some fairly high velocities coming by this rack and it's causing some leakage right here to begin to occur. 
Now, at the moment, I'm okay, uh, but I've got all my air handlers on. Look, they're all blowing. What happens if I lose one? That's an N plus one study. Uh, we can do that in CoolSim with one submission. You can do up to four. You can shut off one, two, three, four of any place, submit them, and they'll all come back at the same time. So in CoolSim, we do parallel processing where each model that gets another core for every million cells. And we also do concurrent processing where you can submit up to four simulations at a time and get the results all back. So it's both parallel and concurrent. Uh, one of the most advanced implementations I've seen, and I've been hanging around this stuff for at least 100 years, I think, feels like. Now, let's go take a look. So this is the velocity. We know what's going on here. This is this is causing some problems. Let's go take a look at that thermal again. So we're going to do thermal. I've got it set here at uh, seven feet. So right at the top of the rack, we should be able to see something here. So let's take a look. Again, we'll go to Y so we can see it. Um, N so we turn off perspective. And I'm going to rotate it so it's in the same orientation we were looking at. And we can see where those racks are beginning to bleed. We're starting to, and and it's not this seven feet, so I'm right at the top of the rack here, but you can see it's starting to come out due to the high velocity coming down that aisle. So it's starting to pull. And uh, that'll cause problems as you begin to vary the air handlers on and off. Uh, so that's, I wanted to show you that one. Uh, let's go again for uh, let, now let's turn the leakage up. Let's go for rack rail here, same design as before. So it's this design where it's, uh, I think, single-sided. We do single-sided here. Yeah, single-sided design, high rack rail leakage. So we turn the leakage way up on this just to show you the effect of a poorly managed data center. And uh, so let's have a look. We'll look at the energy report. You see here that RTI is 96. Now you say, well, why? Why is it down so low? Yet yeah, I've got hot spots. So 96 means that I'm over supplying air by roughly four percent in this case, and yet I still have hot spots. So why is it that I'm oversupplying? Now a common observer, casual observer, would say, as long as I oversupply, I've got no problems in that data center. And I've heard people tell me this. Yeah, well, if you've got leakage, you still got problems, even if you're oversupplying. If you look. Um, we're supplying uh, 233 uh, on a requirement of 224. Uh, and uh, it's probably an N plus one design, so that you know they're giving you enough capacity overall. Let's take a look at the VFDs. This is again being run by a VFD. So we've got a controller in place, and the controller is asking again 77 degrees, but it's now generating 40,000. It's moved up from the earlier run we looked at. It's still not at full capacity, but it's moved up, and we've got hotspots. So let's go take a look at our our uh, Visine chart, and uh, it's not showing much. You see a little bit of a leakage down here. So this is a visual representation of RCI high, is really what it is. You see it's leaking underneath, which is kind of interesting. It's pulling through this rack rail underneath, or the, and you know the bottom of racks are are very susceptible because nobody pays any attention to the bottom of the rack. <laughs> you know, it's like shopping at the store. We all look right where our eyes go. We don't look underneath. And underneath these racks is where you often have trouble. You can see them starting to bleed right there. And so if you look at it in full range of color, where we take color and spread it out over the full set of data we see in the result field, you see where it's leaking. You can also see this in the, again, the slices. So here's a slice at six feet uh, right here. And again, we'll go Y. I'll spin it around for you so it's oriented the same as the way we're looking at the model. So the air handles are at the top. And you can see those the leakage coming right through, right here, bleeding right out into the aisle because we've got velocity, we've, we've got losses up here. It's, it's, we've lost some of our air. In some cases, you'll see it being sucked in. I've seen that before where it sucks in to the uh, to the hot aisle uh, from the cold and, and depletes the air source. That could be what's going on here. So we're leaking in in this case. It's coming in. And here, uh, there's no air left once we get down here. So it's going back out. Rack rail leakage. Uh, here, it's set fairly high, about uh, 30 40%. So, um, 
wanted to show you these um this one as well if you want to look at it i'll, I'll paste this one in copy paste into the so that's in the chat box as well and uh high high ceiling leakage now another thing <laughs> another thing people take for granted is the ceiling's perfect and the ceiling's not perfect so we've been doing some experimentation with a major manufacturer of, of ceilings recently and it turns out ceilings leak and they leak pretty badly so here um same model as before i believe what i did was i put uh, more ceiling grills in the ceiling and let them leak so you'll see them i just pasted them in at various locations and put a leakage on them so not only do you have air going into the hot aisle through the grill but you've got a few grills laying around to represent leakage and i set it for some percentage 10 percent I think I said it. And the same thing happens. That look at this one, RTI 83%, and I've still got a few hot spots. So now I'm overdriving the air tremendously to try to make up and keep the, the temperature at 77 degrees. I'm driving it at 270 when it only needs 244. And I've still got gradient all over the place. So the best way to show it is, is full range. And I'm trying to be sensitive to time here, and we're coming up on the top of the hour. Uh, but you see here i've got problems i've got problems over here because there's not enough air over there the, the first diffuser is is here so getting air over there is a problem particularly if it's leaking through the ceiling and there's no air left to go there it's just short circuiting if we look at path lines from diffusers which is down here so this is path lines from ducts and diffusers you probably see the air going right up into the ceiling and leaking out there it is right there so we've got air just blowing right through leaking leaving the room so to speak and going back to the air handlers that reduces the delta t on the air handler uses up all the air doesn't go through the server ends up causing uh, uh thermal problems in the room so that's a number of uh of them that i wanted to show you today um hot oil containment is is sensitive to rack and ceiling leakage and i want you to be aware of that and talk to your customer or your whoever colleague about these things Ceiling leakage can be a problem. Uh, be careful of width in the hot aisle. I've seen some designs lately where the hot aisles are narrow. And the problem with a hot aisle that's narrow is you've got this pressure surge in the center as densities rise. Early on, it's not a problem because you can get away with it uh, because the data center is not heavily loaded. But as it loads up, those hot air streams will bang into each other, cause a static pressure rise in the center of that hot aisle, and that forces the hot air back through the rack rails uh, if they are not sealed properly. And containment makes cooling failure scenarios more critical because uh, if I've got the hot aisle sealed and I lose the air handler, there's no way to move the air into the room or out of the hot, and that's a problem. So um, <clears throat> we'll do that, deal that with that in a future topic. I'm going to do a transient work probably in the next one. So uh, Keep on the lookout for that one. Now, I got a few questions coming in here. One of them is, seems to be a lot of wasted space in the layout to address velocity and pressure problems. Yep, there is. Um, so, you know, you do have to give it some room or else you run into velocity problems. So that's, that's clear. Uh, sometimes it required you have fans in the aisles. Yes, that's true. There's a lot of, a lot of fooling around to push air around in the room uh, because it doesn't get evenly distributed. You should not have to do that. It, that's why you should use CFD up front. Of course, you know, I'm, I'm in the business of making lemonade, so everything looks like lemons. But if you don't have a tool to understand the flows that are going on in the room, and I'll give you a simple example, and it's um, this high ceiling leakage example. So let me pop that one again. And the diffusers in this design were not laid out with anything in mind. Either that or the racks were not laid out uh, particularly well, because what's happening here is the diffusers are not lining up well with, uh, with the racks. So let me go here Y again. Let me spin this thing around so you can see these flows out of these diffusers. And let me turn off perspective. And uh, I'm going to hide this body and hide again. So these are just mouse clicks. So you can see what's happening is 
you've got a whole aisle over here that's not doesn't have a lot of diffusers near it. Now this is a ceiling in it, so these are leaking ceilings. Let me let me hide that too. So, but here's the velocity coming out, the air coming out, and it gets way over here. It's missing this whole section. Um, and this one's bouncing and going this way. You have high velocity there. So the location of the diffusers with respect to the racks matters. Uh, or if it was a fan wall, it matters. And having a model like this so that you can understand how those flows are occurring prior to building the data center is important. Or if you're going to do a modification, it's important to understand how these flows work. It's not always intuitive. You can't always just look at it and know, even though I've run enough of these models now so that I can pretty much predict situations um, based on experience. So um, I wanted to close this thing up. It's top of the hour. I'm a little bit over. I want to thank you all for coming to the event today. If you have any questions, you want a demo, you want to try this stuff out, let me know. We're quite flexible. Uh, this is the most cost-effective solution you'll find in this area. So, uh, And we're flexible and willing to work with you no matter where you are in the world uh, and uh, whatever your currency is. So we'll figure out a way to, to work with you. Uh, again, Paul Bemis. Uh, my email is paul.bemis at coolsimsoftware.com. I forgot to put that somewhere. <laughs> Most of you know me. You've registered. You will get a link to this. Afterwards, we'll have a recording. If you would like a copy of the presentation, please let me know. Thanks again for attending, and have a good day.